if you start shooting and it turns out you're at like a 0.2 BAC and there's two sides to that story, whose side are they going to take more seriously? Right? Uh, all right, you saw me. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today we are talking about getting drunk and shooting people. Well, we're talking about whether or not you are allowed to defend yourself while drinking. So we're going to talk about whether or not you can legally carry while you've been drinking. We're going to talk about whether or not you lose your self-defense rights because you're drunk. And finally, we're going to talk about why it's different if you're drunk in your own home versus drunk out in public having to defend yourself. But before we get started, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting the like button. And please subscribe to our channel channel we've seen lots of um, youtube unsubscribing people recently so if you're watching this check your feed we really really want you to be able to find us when you need us also check out the link in our description for our newsletter which is a wonderful way to find us especially if youtube keeps doing what they're doing yeah but to what kind of started this conversation was a, a ridiculous chain of events that happened here in houston Hey. Thanks, Gotham. Yeah, thanks, Gotham. Uh, let's check out this news report. Now to more breaking news, this time in downtown Houston. Right now, HPD is investigating after an incident of road rage turned into a shooting. This happened just before 1130 last night on Polk Street near the Southwest Freeway. Police say a 50-year-old woman who was drunk sideswiped another car. The victim got out to talk with a drunk woman, but she started shooting. The victim was hit in the shoulder, but will be okay. The suspect drove away, but police later found her and brought her back to the scene. Right now, the woman is facing a DWI charge, but the DA's office is working to figure out what other charges she may face. And so if I'm getting the order of events correctly, drunk lady sideswipes woman. They stop. Um, lady who got sideswiped wants to check out what's going on because she was just involved in a motor vehicle accident. When that happens, um, the drunk driver opens fire on her then immediately flees. Mm -hmm. Police f locate her, bring her back to the scene, end up arresting her for driving while intoxicated. And I imagine she's going to get charged with some additional crimes. Probably. And so that brings up today's issue. Um, I think that we start actually with just some of the general questions. And then we're going to talk through this lady specifically and how it uh, could affect your self-defense incident as well. So generally, Richard, not should you be drinking and carry, but um, can you drink and carry? Yeah, it's, I mean, yes, generally, it's going to depend on your state. And alcohol and firearms, they don't mix. You know, some states say not a drop of alcohol can be in your bloodstream um, while you're carrying. Some states say you can't be intoxicated mm -hmm. and carry. Um, so it's going to depend. But I think uh, a, a natural question a lot of folks have are, you know, let's say, all right, maybe I didn't follow the rules. Maybe I am, you know, carrying while I have some alcohol in my bloodstream or I am past the point of intoxication and I'm carrying. Um, I find myself in a self-defense situation. Maybe I'm going to lose my life. Do I lose my right to defend myself uh, even though maybe I'm breaking the law? Yeah, and the answer is no, but, right? So generally speaking, that is not going to be enough so that you have to just die right because you're breaking the law you're carrying when you're not supposed to because you're intoxicated um you still get to defend yourself but you have put yourself at a huge disadvantage in a couple of ways um one way is i mean depending on your state's law you very well could have lost some of your legal presumption yeah and so what that means is you know some states have different levels of self-defense sometimes i uh, will just call it general self-defense where you know, the burden is typically on the self-defender to persuade a jury that what they did was reasonable and immediately necessary. Well, some states go the extra mile and say, under certain circumstances, maybe you're inside your castle, uh, maybe you are the victim of a armed robbery. Well, we are going to presume that you're reasonable and that your actions were immediately necessary uh, because you fall under those very specific circumstances. But we, what we see in those states are, all right, if you are trespassing or you're committing a crime, mm -hmm. key, key to Bingo. this then you might lose your presum presumptions of reasonableness and then the burden's back on you. Well, in this case, intoxicated person, uh, persuade us to what you did was okay. Yeah, and almost every state's stand your ground law has that qualifier that you cannot stand your ground if you are committing another criminal offense. So if it is in fact a criminal offense in your state to be intoxicated and have a firearm on your person out in public, well, you probably hope you're not too drunk to run. 
Yeah, you know, usually intoxicated people are so reasonable um, that I almost always see them try to retreat before using any amount of force. Absolutely. Yeah, so those two things don't mix. No. So um, let's, although I will say um, for any of the te our Texas audience who is watching, if you have an LTC in Texas, don't worry about it. <laughs> that is true. Our carrying while intoxicated law does not apply to license holders. And that was actually intentional. Yeah, drink up. You know what? I actually tried to fix that. I'm not saying... We did. They called... We, we, our office was like... All right, sidebar. So, yes, when we were passing Texas constitutional or permitless carry here in Texas, um, this was a problem that was a... a little, a little problem in air quotes. This is a known problem. Uh, there was a known solution. And they told us to go right to hell. Well, yeah. I mean, I and I think even the... Not... I mean, several lobbyists reached out to us and were like, hey, we're just trying to get everyone on the same page about the best way to fix this. And, you know, we tried. And the best way was license holders can drink and carry in public. Here we are. Yeah, but the biggest factor I will say that comes up in, you know, we look at what makes a good self-defense case and what intoxication undermines reasonableness. Yes, and that's the biggest problem. And I will say, let's return back to our initial problem with the woman, the sideswiper, the drunk driver. Um, you can imagine you get in an accident with someone and somebody jumps out of their car. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they got something in their hands. It could be a scary situation. Um, if you start shooting and it turns out you're at like a 0.2 BAC and there's two sides to that story, whose side are they going to take more seriously? Right? Uh, uh, you saw me. No, I know. I mean, exactly. So that's the problem. And like this woman in particular, um, you know, we have multiple cases where our clients have fired shots from inside their closed vehicles. And that is always good evidence for me to present to a jury that my client was terrified. Yeah. Because no one shoots from inside their closed vehicle unless they are so scared they have no other option but it's the standard we operate under is a ordinary and prudent person not an ordinary and prudent intoxicated person right but i mean but see the intoxication like cuts that argument out of the water because it's like yeah. why did she fire from inside her closed vehicle well either she was really really scared or she was just drunk yeah she didn't know the window was up yeah you know she like it just it undercuts the most important thing you need for self-defense, which is that you are an ordinary and prudent person, that you acted reasonably. Yeah, but I, let's see. How, let's change a few facts and see how this goes, uh, because I'll say, you know, while this incident happened out in public, we see quite a few self-defense incidents happen inside of the house. Um, there is no law saying you can't drink in your house um correct again i will quote our favorite judge in galveston you are allowed um nay encouraged to get r knee slapping toilet hugging drunk in your own home he's a show watcher he, he'll see that watching. <laughs> uh, so yes you can i mean in your own home first of all you're not breaking any laws by getting drunk in your own home but also think about how heavily you need to lean on reasonableness if you're in your own home and someone breaks in and you have to use self-defense versus how heavy you have to lean on your own reasonableness if you just get into an altercation out in public right yeah and i think it's it goes to the element of innocent innocence or clean mm -hmm. hands you know you're in your house you are being forced to respond to a threat as opposed to you know, intoxicated person injecting themselves and in, in subjecting the, the public to the whims of, you know, whatever is going on in their mind. So I think there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And I think people are give a little bit more grace. But some people don't want the sauce. Some people want the wacky tobacco. So, um, yes, I would say, again, if you're intoxicated and bear in mind, you can be intoxicated, not just on alcohol, not just on illegal drugs. Right. I mean, I guess marijuana might be legal in your state. However, if you're smoking much marijuana, you probably under federal law are not in lawful possession of the firearm. So you've got yourself into a world of problems there. But you can become intoxicated on perfectly legal drugs that were prescribed to you by your doctor. So you need to understand what the definition of intoxication is in your state. And you need to be sure, I think, if you're carrying a firearm, that you're in a position to be responsible to not be intoxicated and therefore 
to be imminently reasonable and be a good steward of the Second Amendment. Yeah, and what I tell my folks are, hey, if you wouldn't go drive a car, that's not a good time to carry. And that stinks because a lot of people take medications prescribed mm -hmm. by a doctor sure. and they wouldn't drive a car. Uh, but you might need to come up with some alternative um, way to make sure that you keep safe. Maybe it's your spouse. Uh, maybe it's another family member that's in the house. Uh, but you have to use extreme caution under those circumstances. Absolutely. But we hope you enjoy this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And please question and comment for us below. Until next time, we're the Arms Attorneys. Call to action. Buy Emily a bunch of golf balls. She really likes the game of golf and would appreciate it if you mailed her golf balls to the office. What? It's for me. Oh, they're for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>